through it is a billionaire oil magnate that has sued to prevent EPA regulations. <clears throat> regulations. He has also publicly vowed to cancel the Paris Climate Accord. Trump's nominee for Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is the former president and chief executive of ExxonMobil. And lastly, his pick for the Secretary of the Interior, Ryan Zink, has claimed that the science behind climate change proves to be unsettled. Well, here to teach us about the dangers of such science denial and climate change is Dr. Mark Hickson, who is the Shao Endowed Professor of Marine Biology and a global expert on coral reefs, which are suffering greatly from climate disruption. If everyone can please give a clap for Dr. Mark Hickson. Aloha. God, Donald Trump versus science. Aloha. Aloha. Donald Trump versus climate science. Oh my God. First, a little bit about science. Ranging from traditional knowledge of ecology and astronomy by native peoples around the world, such as beautifully illustrated behind you here for the Hawaiian people, all the way up to the esoteric quantum mechanics of Nobel laureates. Science is the most powerful method humans have yet devised to understand the natural world and the universe. Science has produced all our modern comforts and our greatest achievements. At the same time, when abused, science threatens our very existence. Clearly, no one and no society can long survive by denying and abusing science. Unfortunately, Donald Trump repeatedly denies and disparages perfectly good science. To quote the editors of the venerable periodical Scientific American, Trump's views on science are shockingly ignorant. His statements show a disregard for science that is alarming. For example, Mr. Trump believes that when he sprays hairspray on his head, those gases do not enter the atmosphere. He believes that energy efficient lighting causes cancer. Both wrong. He believes that common vaccines cause autism. Wrong. Most importantly, Trump has called climate change bullshit and a hoax. Dangerously wrong. His pending federal appointments include Scott Pruitt as administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, who has characterized himself as a leading advocate against EPA's activist agenda, including the Paris Climate Accords, and who asserts that the debate about climate war global warming is far from settled. Absolutely false. Trump wants Rex Tillerson, who spent his entire career working for oil giant Exxon, to be the Secretary of State. Exxon has spent $33 million since the 1990s in efforts to deny climate science, even though its own scientists stated very clearly in the 1970s that climate change was real and caused by human activity. The author and philosopher Aldous Huxley has warned us, facts do not cease to exist if they are ignored. <laughs> Climate disruption is real, is caused by humans, and is affecting us all. Here in Hawaii, rainfall patterns are shifting 
which will affect everything and everyone. Avian malaria, as the air warms, is spreading to higher elevations, killing our native birds. Coral reefs are stressed, and many will die as the oceans continue to warm and acidify. Hurricanes are intensifying, and sea levels are rising, increasing the coastal erosion. In just a number of decades, Waikiki, Kaka'ako, and other low-lying areas will be underwater. cost to tourism and our economy will be immense. Importantly, these and other threats are increasing exponentially. That is, they're getting worse at an accelerating pace. You ain't seen nothing yet. We cannot afford four years of denial. Our children and grandchildren certainly cannot afford that delay in action. I ask all my fellow scientists to become activists, defending science at every opportunity. We can no longer afford to hide in the ivory tower behind the wall of science, perpetuating the fallacy that scientists should not participate in policy debates that involve science. I did not abdicate my citizenship when I became a scientist. I ask all my fellow citizens to reject fake news and completely reject this new time of post-truth. Please, get your science from reputable, peer-reviewed sources rather than media personalities, unsubstantiated blogs, and the like. For climate science, I recommend three web pages. Climate Central, Real Climate, and Skeptical Science. I'd be happy to send the links to anyone. To, win, to, to again quote some words of wisdom from others. If not us, who? If not now, when? All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for the good to do nothing. Please, for the sake of ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren, act. As a postscript, I believe what is needed is for all of us to engage in what's called the great turning, shifting from destructive empire of consumerism to just and sustainable earth community. So if you want to help people while you're stuck in traffic, think about that. I still have a few of the Join the Great Turning Bumper stickers. Those of you who promised to put them on your cars, I'll give them to you. I only have a few left. Thank you so much. Shit, shit don't change unless, you know, you out on the street. So think about, uh, what's it, the song in Les Mis, do you hear the people sing? Is your ass singing today? Are you singing? What song of freedom will you sing today? Are you singing or are you slinging? Huh? Are you singing or are you slinging? Yeah, this sign right now. Solid, sir. Oh, fuck. Solid? Yeah. Good day. Fuck Donald Trump. Oh, there you go. With the condom. Yeah, d yeah. That is necessary. Careful. Two, maybe. See you down there, man. Oh, yeah, we, we don't. We don't need no whatever. Fascist. Yeah, that's the word. Thank you. Hey. of a database to track the actions of our Muslim residents and citizens. He also called for a prohibition on the entry of Muslims into the United States. 
In addition to these heinous proposals, Trump's appointment to Secretary of Defense, James Mad Dog Mattis, has been shown to have a callous disregard for human life, particularly of citizens, civilians, when making comments such as, it's fun to shoot some people. You know, it's a hell of a hoot. Mad Dog obviously has a different definition of fun than we do. In addition to demanding that Trump empty his cabinet of people like Mad Dog, Hawaii J20 demands that Trump rescind his appointment of Steve Bannon as his chief strategist and senior counselor. Bannon is an ex Goldman Sachs banker and the former head of the infamous fake news site that Mark Hickson just warned us about, Breitbart. He is an avowed supporter of white nationalism, racism, anti Semitism, Islamophobia, misogyny, xenophobia, homophobia, and transphobia. Here to talk about the dangers of Islamophobia in the age of, age of Trump is recent graduate of UH Manoa, Esma Arslan. into office today. As many of you are aware, the media has not been kind to us Muslims ever since 9-11 in 2001, and even more so when Mr. Trump began his campaign that eventually ended with a win in 2016. It has become apparent to me that Mr. Trump is rather uninformed about my religion and tends to believe the common misconceptions about Islam that have spread far and wide and are often accepted as adamant truths. I want to talk about the three that I think are the biggest and of course the worst misconceptions about my religion. Misconception number one, Islam is a religion of terrorism or promotes terroristic activity or extremism. I can't even begin to tell you how incorrect this statement is, so I will only make two comments. that the word Islam comes from the root word Salam, which literally means peace. Second of all, as the well-informed sphere of the internet has made apparent, Muslims make up 25% of the world population and is the fastest growing religion. Thus, if all 1.7 billion Muslims in the world were terrorists, well, we would have bigger problems than Trump becoming president. Misconception number two, Islam oppresses women. The very fact that I'm standing here today as a graduated pre-med student on my way to med school is proof that this religion does not tolerate female oppression. I chose to wear my headscarf myself. Nobody forced me and nobody decided for me. And while it may seem that the religion is unfair or biased against women, I have realized even more so how equal and maybe even more fair this religion is towards its women. In Islam, a mother is revered three times more than a father, for she is the birther, the nurturer of the next generation. And when a woman gets married, as per Islamic law, she inherits everything that her husband owns. However, she also keeps everything she has or will have. A husband has no claims to his wives in the most introductory level religion courses that Islam, Christianity, and Judaism are all cousin religions, referred to as people of the book. Muslims absolutely believe in Prophet Jesus. He is the most revered man in our religion. To say that a Muslim doesn't believe in Jesus is practically blasphemy. While it is true that we do not believe he was crucified or that he's the son of God, we most definitely believe that he existed and that he was a holy man who spread
spread messages of peace, tolerance, and love. The same messages that all world religions aspire to spread. There are many other misconceptions that I don't have the time to go over, but I'm just gonna make a quick list, just to make you aware that they're false. Fathers and husbands are allowed to beat their wives and daughters. Not true at all. All marriages are arranged. Definitely wrong. Women are required to wear burqas. Definitely wrong. Women cannot be educated. Women are only allowed to become housewives. All false. Muslims don't believe in science or evolution. Of course wrong. I have a degree in biology. <laughs> favorite is when people ask me, do you speak Muslim? Are you Arabic? Are you from Islam? And I kindly explain, Muslim is not a language, Arabic is not an ethnicity, and Islam is not a country. Now that Donald Trump will be our president for the next four years, we have to pay special attention to the minorities of this nation, for this country was built on the immigration of colonists who were themselves a minority. Trump clearly does not understand, nor does he value the history of America and the true origins of this country. He may try to divide us through racism and ignorance, sure claiming that immigrants must be deported, Muslims must be registered into a national database, and the borders must be closed, all in the name of American public safety. He may propagate any and or all of the misconceptions of Islam, and the only way to stand in solidarity is to educate ourselves on the things and the people and the religions and the cultures that we do not understand or are not familiar with. This knowledge will create trust and dissipate the fear that the unknown often brings. At the end of the day, Muslims are human beings. There are good Muslims and there are bad Muslims. But believe me when I say there are more of us that are good than bad. Lastly, I want it to be known to those who fear ISIS and fear terrorists and fear Muslim radicals, you are not alone. Your fear is not unwarranted. For we, the Muslims, are also afraid of these crazy people who claim to be part of our religion and yet take Muslim lives in Syria, Gaza, Yemen, even though I am speaking on behalf of Muslims today, I realize that we must all stand in solidarity with each other, never leave the minorities behind, and never remain silent. Thank you.
Hawaii Center for Food Safety, the Hawaii Coalition for Justice in Palestine, the Hawaii Interfaith Power and Light, Hawaii Okinawa Alliance, Hawaii People's Fund, Idle No More Hawaii, Our Revolution Hawaii, Sierra Club, the UH Biology Alumni Association, Veterans for Peace, Hawaii Chapter, and Mal uh, Malu Aina. While the election of Trump is beyond alarming to many Americans, it is important to note that this election is actually a part of a global trend. From Brexit to the rise of Marie Le Pen in France, we have seen the ascendance of right-wing politicians and movements which have been dubbed the global rise of populism. To help us make sense of populism is political science professor, Dr. Kathy Ferguson. Hi. My name's Kathy Ferguson. I'm from the uh, Department of I'm from the Department of Political Science and Women's Studies, and I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about populism. So I have three things I want to cover. The first is what, what is populism? The second is what do populists do? And the third is what can we do? Okay, so what's populism? Consult your Latin, I'm sure you can all translate. Ism is a belief in, populi are the people. Populism literally means a belief in the people or the voice of the people. So how does that, that, that of course begs the most important question, who count as the people? Okay. So what populists typically do is they make very uh, loud noises about be critical of the elites. That is, there's a lot of show about criticizing up the hierarchy. And the famous phrase that Donald Trump has coined, or not coined, but used, is drain the swamp. Right? We're going to drain the swamp. Okay, first side point here. Be very careful of metaphors. Okay? The phrase drain the swamp is actually an insult to swamps everywhere. Okay? Swamps are good things. Swamps are wetlands. Swamps are marshes. Swamps are habitats. So the very idea that we would use that word in a political critique undermines the critique itself. Right? So be careful of your metaphors. Right. Um, secondly, the, the, same, the impulse against the show of criticizing us is quickly replaced by criticizing sideways and criticizing down. Okay, so it's much easier, and thus the anger tends to flow better, down the hierarchy, find somebody less powerful than you, and blame them, okay? Okay, a third point is populism is, it's really important to realize it builds on genuine grievances. It wouldn't have a, a hold on very many people if it didn't in some way address a heartfelt fear or anger that or hope that they have. Um, many, I think, in, in a perverse sort of way, I take comfort from hearing Trump supporters say the system is rigged, the system needs to be changed. Yes, it does. Trump doesn't know how, but yes, it does. to who count as the people. If someone like Donald Trump is in a position of deciding who count as the people, then other people who are like him get to be the people, right? And the rest of us are not the people. So what does that make us? And it's very easy then to segue into, well, then you are the enemies of the people. So a judge in Indiana of Mexican descent isn't a judge, right? He's, he's a Mexican, and, and then that gets folded into what the word Mexican comes to mean. Obama isn't really an American, right? He's something else. And so populism, which has this great sort of egalitarian ring to it, the people, 
turns out to be a vehicle for slowly slicing off, or even not very slowly, slicing off group after group after group who don't get to be the people. Okay? Um, two more things. No, uh, one more, I'll stick with that. Is that we need to understand that the system the, of, of democratic, or at least republic, um, uh, institutions can readily give rise to populism because it can be easily, well, maybe not easily, but it can be combined with capitalism, racism, patriarchy, homophobia, all the different strategies of creating hierarchy and legitimating some at the expense of others. So democracy, unfortunately, when you combine it with all kinds of other inequalities, invites populism. It's not an accident. Okay, it's a consequence of a certain set of contradictions that on the one hand claim equality and on the other hand enforce inequality. Okay, so that's what I think populism is. Let me tell you what populists do. First, they, excuse me, they hijack the state apparatus, which means not just at the national level, like the cabinet we were talking about, but at local and state levels. So beware of what's going to happen to efforts to reform police. What's going to happen to efforts to not build more prisons? What's going to happen to local and state initiatives under this, uh, under this regime? Okay, we're, we're, when you empower reactionary forces, it trickles down. A uh, second thing populism does is it curries relationships with clients. And in poor countries, scholars like to call that patron-client relationships. In our country, scholars call it interest groups or something benign sounding, but it's the same idea that there are sets of patron-client relations um, that sustain the, the network. Okay? And then lastly, populism, ironically, suppresses civil society. And one of the ways it does that is to build on a politics of fear so that we are afraid to gather together, so that it's safer to stay home, it's safer to shut up. It, we, it, it creates, in the name of the people, less and less room for actual people to talk. All right, and then the last thing is that it distracts us with sideshows. So let me talk about that in a minute. Because this leads me to what should we do? And I got three things. There's a million, right? But here's three. One is don't fall for the diversions. Whenever there's a thing going on that is a look over there, right? Don't look over there. Look at the thing that he doesn't want us to look at, right? So when he called for the criminalization of flag burning, and I'm saying, are there a lot of people burning? Is there an epidemic of flag burning? Have I missed it? Okay. It wasn't about anything that was happening. It was a look over there gesture. The same when he says, John Lewis is all talk and no action. That was an effort to get us to get off on that. But, and then of course, Meryl Streep is a bad actress. Right? Those are just three of the most recent look over there's. And what we need to remember is that two things. One is kind of obvious, which that he's busy putting arsonists in charge of the firehouse. All right? That all of these zombies are people who will destroy the apparatuses they're supposed to be administering. And notice I didn't say fox in the hen house. That foxes need to eat, okay? People don't need to be rich. Right? And then the last thing is go local, get involved. We have, when I was born, one out of three American workers were members of unions. It's now one out of ten. We have a union, we need to protect it. Get involved, raise your voice, assemble, do what you're doing. Thank you very much.
land of our ancestors. This is the land of the first people of this land, Kanakamoli. And from the beginning, we came from the Ko'a and the deep Pohonu, the deepest waters and the deepest po of the night. And we became the single-celled creatures and we rose up. And out of the earth and out of the loam came the many people, came Papa Hanamoku. Wakea. This is the land. We are people and children of that land. And we welcome all of you who stand with us, who stand in this world against the darkness that is to come. We are the watchers in the dark in the coldest winter. I just came back from Standing Rock. And I'm part of the the globe, indigenous peoples are at the front line of every ecological struggle. And why is that? Why is that? Because the First Nations of the world have always stood against subjugation, oppression, and destruction. They had to destroy our land, they had to destroy our people because we live in sustainability with the community. So, Ayo, it's time to hold them up. I'd like to take a short break to read excerpts from a poem by the great Langston Hughes titled, Let America Be America Again, written in 1937. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plain, seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriot wreath. But opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I see and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. Who said the phrase? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when they strike? The millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we've dreamt, all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung, there's millions who have nothing for our pay, except a dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet, and yet must be the land where every man is free. The land that's mine, the poor man's, the Indians, the Negroes, me. Who made America? Whose sweat and blood? Whose faith and pain? Whose hand at the foundry? Whose plow in the rain? Must bring back our mighty dream again. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath. America will be. Out of the rock, out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we, the people, must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these green, green states and make America again. Although this poem was written 80 years ago, it still resonates with many, as President Trump promises to make America great again. But this has left many of us to wonder, for whom was America great for, and for whom is it being made great again? Here to talk about the movement for black lives in the age of Trump is Honolulu Black Lives activist, Prentice Hemphill. <laughs> Y'all with me say yeah. yeah. Y'all with me say yeah. yeah. All right, making sure I have your attention.
attention. I have eight minutes to talk about anti-blackness in the U.S. and what we're going to do about it. Um, so I'm not going to be able to do that, um, but I do want to say a couple words. Um, Black Lives Matter, I'm the Healing Justice Director of Black Lives Matter, I'm on staff there. Uh, Black Lives Matter is a cry and a call. Um, it's a cry that says we are here to reconcile our history, of uh, the aspirations that we claim for the U.S. of freedom for all of its citizens with the actual way our systems are functioning, with the actual marginalization of certain people. So Black Lives Matter is a cry, right? We know that all living things matter, are uniquely valuable, and we also know that our systems do not reflect that. And that's why we have to say Black Lives Matter, so we can reconcile that. <laughs> It's also uh, an upset to the way we uh, put hierarchies on how lives are valued, right? So if we say all black lives matter, we, don't, we mean black men matter, we mean black disabled people matter, we mean black Muslims matter, we mean black trans people matter, we mean black queer people matter, we mean black poor people matter. That's what we mean. We mean all black people have to matter, right? And if we know that that's true, what kinds of systems do we create out of that reality? And how do we change the ones we currently have to reflect what we all deeply know? That all life is invaluable, that all life matters, and that all people need to be nurtured and given the space to heal and grow and develop and be who they are here to be. Um, the person who was uh, inaugurated today um, has a plan for black America. And one of the main tenets of that plan says that the problem is not, the problem, the problem in black communities is not uh, police. It's that we don't have enough police. That's what the plan states. I want us to, to listen to that in a historical context. Um, black people, black communities are, black and indigenous communities are the most policed communities, um, are incarcerated exponentially, right? Are, are likely to serve longer terms and longer sentences than any other groups of people. So to me, when I think about what's splitting apart our communities, what's, what's damaging our folks, it's not that we lack police. It's that we are disproportionately suffering at the hands of mass incarceration, of a police state, and that's what has to be remedied and changed for indigenous and black communities. And All right, so a um, couple more things, a couple more points. Uh, black and indigenous oppression is really the essential contradiction of the U.S. context. And those issues have to be named, resolved, addressed, and acted upon for any of us to actually be free, to resolve the essential contradictions of where we live. So, um, and what I want to say about that, anti-blackness permeates everything, right? Anti-blackness is in our psychology, it's in the way we move, it's in our institutions, it's in how we think. It permeates everything because it is foundational to how everything has been built. So we have to uproot it in ourselves. It's a psychological, spiritual exercise, and it's also a political exercise. What are you willing to do to change? And what are you willing to change? What institutions are you willing to change? That's the call. Um, in this moment, we all have to resist. We have to shake up our complacency. Uh, we have to get out of our comfort zones, and we have to be willing to change, to shift, to learn in the pursuit of justice. The stakes are high. That's why you're out here. And there's so many people that need to be out here. The stakes are high and we have a lot of work to do. And we're all gonna be impacted and there's no room for bystanders. So I'm asking each of you to assess your life, to as assess your position. Where is it that you could risk? Where is it that you can learn? Where is it that you can reach across and connect with someone? Where is it that you need to change and get active about that? There is no time in the future to do that. The time is literally now. Um, 
and the last thing um, I'll do is I'm going to close out with a chant that we do at a lot of the Black Lives Matter rallies and events. Um, our elder, Sada Shakur, came up with this, and I want to share it with you all and ask you to participate and bring your hearts into it, okay? So it, it builds. We start with a whisper, we move to a speaking voice, and then we're going to escalate to yelling, right? To letting it all out, all right? Y'all with me? Yeah. All right, cool. So uh, I'm going to say it, then I want you to repeat after me, all right? It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. To lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. It is our duty to win. We must love and support one another. We must love and support one another. We, love support one another. we have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. I say thank you. Rachel Schutz, Joyce Mariano, and Mari Yoshihara. Thank you. Hello, hi everyone. I'm Mari Yoshihara from the Department of American Studies. I'm not going to speak much because this is not this is actually not a performance. This is for all of you and us to sing together. Um, music, especially singing, has had a very important place in American social movements as well as various kinds of social movements worldwide. Um, songs themselves do not change the world, unfortunately, but they often do heal, they inspire, they empower, they unite, and very literally, they give people the voice, and they also force us to listen to one another. So I would like us to sing together. I have distributed the words for some of the songs. Um, if you don't have one with you, please share. Um, the first one we're going to do is We Shall Not Be Moved. As many songs in the folk tradition, this is not attributed to any particular individual lyricist or composer, but it is believed to go back to the slavery era. And then it had a modern transformation in the 1930s when it became anthem of the labor movement, especially led by Mexican-American workers. Um, there was a major strike of um, people in the pecan industry in, in um, Texas, San Antonio, Texas, led by a young woman, Emma Tiguana, in, in 1938. And then this became an anthem of the, of the labor movement, especially with the leadership of uh, Cesar Chavez, who was the co-founder and leader of the United Farm Workers Union. Um, the words are very simple. The first line changes, but the rest are, are the same. I'm gonna be, the song is gonna be led by my friend Rachel Schutz, a wonderful singer, you will all join us. Ah. We shall not be moved. We shall not be moved. We shall not be moved. It starts, the union is behind us. We shall not be moved. The union is behind us. We shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the river, the union is behind us. We shall not be moved. Each verse, I'll call out that changing line. So those of you that don't have text, you can still sing along with us.
This one, what do you think of this one? It's big. Big? Biggest one I've seen in a few years. A few years, yeah, since APEC, right? Yeah. Um, I think the Hawaiians had a, they had a parade through Waikiki. It was just yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for singing along. Our next speaker will give us the opportunity to see the connections between global, national, and local struggles as he describes the impact of the election on Native Hawaiian issues. Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Osario, professor of the Kamakakuokalani Center for Hawaiian Studies. Aloha. Aloha. See, you're not gonna get that if you say that in a college campus in California or Alabama or Washington. Um, you only get that here. And that's my message today. We shouldn't call this the age of Trump. We should call this the age of clarity. Kanaka Maoli, Native Hawaiians, and the people 
that I descend from, who were citizens of the Hawaiian nation in the 19th century, we know what it is to fight American presidents. And I want to, my brief message to you today is you might want to listen a little bit to our experience and know how to not only fight this president effectively, but to fight this president uh, and still stay alive to fight another day. We fought William McKinley, who wanted to enact a treaty of, of annexation with the Republic of Hawaii. We fought him in 1897 with over 30,000 signatures, 38,000 signatures on two petitions, and we won that fight. The United States never annexed the Hawaiian Islands. We fought, well, we fought lots of presidents, but we fought Jimmy Carter over the possession and occupation of Kaho'olawe, and the Navy had Kaho'olawe, and the Navy did what it wanted to do until Native Hawaiian young people, no older than any of the youngest of you here, fought that president, that Navy, and won that battle. Hell, we even fought Jimmy Carter over the Trans-Pacific Partnership and it looks like we're gonna win that one too. I wanna to tell all of you that there is an opportunity here with this president because it is not just native people now who see the worst aspects of American, of American expansion, of American empire. All of our citizens have the capacity to see the problems that this brings, this overweening arrogance this overwhelming dependence on militarism, this complete faith in the market and in capital. These are the things that have brought America to this place, to this place where you have a president that clearly half of the country at least um, fears and loathes. Our task in the future and over the next few years certainly is going to be how to fight this effectively and I'm going to tell you that it comes first of all with patience and 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 the breakdown of barriers between all of us this is not just an issue for people of color this is not just an issue for women this is not just an issue for people um, who are want to protect their own bodies. This is not just for Native people. This is for everyone. We are all in this fight, and we must hold hands together through it. Always end with a song. Um, some of you will know this, um, and you won't be able to hear the guitar, so you're only going to be able to hear your own voices. Uh, this is a song written by an American missionary just so you understand that there are always ironies everywhere. Uh, this missionary, Lorenzo Lyons, wrote this incredibly beautiful patriotic song. Not really a hymn, but a national anthem for our people. And we've been singing it ever since. If you've sung it before, you can sing it with me now. This is a song that simply praises the beauty of this place, the beauty of its young people, and really commits ourselves to love this place until we die.
other speakers and performers today, the resistance will take many forms. Trump's administration intends to overturn some of the greatest health programs and protections ever provided to the American people. While the Affordable Care Act surely has its faults, repealing it without a viable replacement will leave millions of people without access to health care. Trump's appointment of Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tom Price, is intent on dramatically cutting Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. He's a strong opponent of Planned Parenthood and abortion, and once claimed that he did not know a single woman who could not afford birth control. Defunding Planned Parenthood will not end abortion, but it will result in sicker women and children and more deaths. Our next speaker, Professor, Professor Sylvia Law of New York University School of Law, is a leading scholar in the fields of health law, women's rights, poverty, and constitutional law. And she is here to talk about to talk about Medicare, Medicaid, and the Affordable Care Act. Aloha. Actually, I would have preferred to be introduced as a comma Ina, long-term, part-time of the state that first adopted universal health insurance in 1974. I want to start with a little history. It wasn't until the mid-20th century it wasn't until the mid-20th century that medicine could do more good than harm. And at that point, we realized that almost no one could afford medicine at the time they needed it, that we needed insurance. Uh, other developed countries took a different path and adopted national health insurance. Uh, we opted for a patchwork. And the heart of our patchwork is a federal subsidy to employers who offer insurance to their workers. Now that's good, it's still the heart of our system, but it leaves a lot of people out. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, local nonprofit Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations were created around the country. They offered insurance, uh, open enrollment, anyone could sign up, uh, uh, community rating, same rate for everybody, whatever the risk you can present it. And they were very successful, so successful that the profit-making insurers entered the market. And they had different principles. They wanted to keep out people who were at risk. They wanted to charge more to people who were at risk. And that created a crisis, particularly for the elderly, because older folks you can identify them easily. You know that they are at higher risk of needing medical care. Um, uh, but the elderly are also people who vote. And in 1964, the elderly mobilized to insist on some kind of public health insurance for them. Uh, in 64, we elected, unlike this year, a Democratic president, House, and Senate. And the political force behind that was largely the el elderly's plea for health insurance. That resulted in Medicare, great program for the old folks and the disabled, uh, Medicaid, state federal cooperative program for poor people. Uh, but by 2008, when Obama was elected, he found a system in crisis. Uh, labor markets had changed so that most work was no longer full-time work with benefits and unionized jobs, but rather part-time contingent work that didn't carry jobs. Uh, Medicare was in crisis because it was a very, it's a very thin program. It's for acute care, not for ordinary care. And Medicaid, the workhorse of our healthcare system, is, uh, depends on state financing, which is inherently regressive. And states found themselves caught between the healthcare needs of their populations and resistance to paying higher taxes. Uh, every Democratic president since Harry Truman has sought to adopt national health insurance. Uh, Clinton tried. He failed. When he failed, Kennedy pulled together a group of people, Ted Kennedy, and all the states 
stakeholders and tried to figure out a way forward. The thing they came up with is a mess. It's Obamacare. It's the Affordable Care Act. It's a product of compromise. Um, it was adopted on a strict party line vote in December 2008, challenged in the courts. Uh, the, the House has 60 times voted to repeal it. In 15, when the Republicans took the Senate, they repealed it again. Obama multiple times had to veto those. Um, now, all three branches are controlled by the Republicans. What are they going to do? Well, all through the campaign, they said, repeal on day one. That's our number one priority. The minute they're elected, they say, that might not be good to throw um, millions of people off of health care. So they said, repeal and delay. And the entire health care industry and insurance industry said, that's crazy. We can't live with delay until the next elections in 18, or maybe until 2020. And everybody said, no, we can't live with that. So now it's repeal and replace. But they haven't come up with, a, with an answer to what they'll replace it with. Meanwhile, the Affordable Care Act has transformed health care in America. 20 million people gained health insurance coverage for the first time. The rate of kid insurance is now higher than it's ever been, 94.7%. Premiums have grown more slowly than they had before Obamacare. In Hawaii, uh, 13,000 people gained coverage. Uh, lots of people qualified for tax credits of $270 a month on average. Benefits for people covered by employment have been improved. Uh, they ended the act ended discrimination on the basis of pre-existing conditions in the employment market. Uh, 9,000 Hawaii young people were added to their parents' policies. 33,000 people in Hawaii gained Medicare coverage. Uh, for Medicare people, the most important thing might have been lowering the cost of prescription drugs and also guaranteeing an annual wellness physical and all kinds of preventive services without cost sharing. Um, Obamacare is not perfect. The incentives to encourage people to sign up are too weak. The premium supports for middle class people are too um, small. Um, repeal is not the only thing that is promised by the new um, Republican administration. Uh, for, example, for example, Tom Price, uh, the nominee to be Secretary of Health and Human Services, proposes to cut uh, $12 million for Medicare and a trillion for Medicaid. Paul Ryan has long argued to end the entitlement nature of Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen on the campaign trail. Trump said he wouldn't touch Medicare and Medicaid, but who knows what's going to happen now. So what can we do? Pay attention. It's really complex. It's hard to know what news is fake news, but there's a lot of fake news out there. Celebrate the successes uh, and insist on concrete plans, not slogans, before we get rid of this program that's been essentially important for so many of our people. Thank you.
that we'll be lining up to march at 2:30 to meet our friends in ypda ikea and the world can't wait please make sure that your phones are charged and that you have water and sunscreen if you're interested in making some noise with our noise makers and leading the march please let us know uh, you can go ahead and talk to professor gay chan and I'd also like to give a big thank you to the members of the art department, art and art history, for taking the time out of their busy schedules to create the noisemakers, t-shirts, and art pieces. I'd also like to say thank you to the UH printmaking department, who has printed all these t-shirts for free. They've dedicated their time and resources. I would also like to thank everybody that's helped out pass flyers and t-shirts over the last couple weeks. We couldn't have done any of this without you. We still have some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches right over here. If anybody's interested, please feel free to get up at any time to grab some. And then before I welcome our next speaker, I would like to take this time to thank a lot of some of our endorsers. The LGBTQ Center at UH Manoa, the Hawaii Institute for Human Rights, the International Cultural Studies Program at UH Manoa, the UH Manoa Library Senate, UH students and faculty for justice in Palestine, the Women's March Oahu, the Academy for Creative Media, UH Manoa, the Center for Biographical Research, the Occupy Honolulu, Forum of Hawaii, Eden in Public, and lastly, the William S. Richardson School of Law. Woo! Our next professor, our next speaker is a professor in the Richardson School of Law, and she's a political activist whose cases have established important legal precedent in the area of pregnancy discrimination, sexual harassment, and the rights of workers affected by mass layoffs. Today, Professor Linda Krieger is here to talk about issues related to health care and the LGBTQI um, population. Thank you. I've got news for you. Donald J. Trump is the president and we are all queer now. You are a woman with a uterus and you think the government should stay out of it? You are queer. If you are a man who thinks women and men are equal and that men are entitled to feelings just like women are, you are queer. Not only that, we all have AIDS now. If you are person with a pre-existing condition, you have AIDS. If you are a person who is too poor to buy your own health care, you have AIDS. If you are old and your Medicare is being cut, you have AIDS. So, we all need to learn two chants that we used to chant back in the day. But they're not just for us anymore, they're for everybody. Here's the first one. We're here! We're queer! Get used to it! AIDS now, so, but it's hate, it's not just AIDS, it's hate, so act up, fight back, fight hate, act up, fight back, fight hate, act up, fight back, fight hate, so I am sure that almost everyone here thinks that in the past few years, the LGBTQ community has made tremendous strides in achieving equal rights and equal dignity in this country. 
and you would be right to think that. But what you may not know is that those advances are extremely fragile and are now under tremendous threat. On my cell phone, about an hour and a half ago, the White House LGBTQ outreach site shut down. Oh. It is gone. It is already gone. Right alongside the White House climate change site, which is also already gone, and in its place is a website that's called America First Energy. Get the picture? The, this is not what might happen. This is not what we can wait and see if it happens. Do not expect that to last even a week. It is only because of an executive order signed by President Obama and put into place by the Department of Health and Human Services that transgender people have a right to equal access to health insurance in this country. It is only because of regulations and an executive order by President Obama that LGBTQ elders in nursing homes have a right not to be harassed either by other nursing home residents or by nursing home staff, or have a right to equal health care or equal rights in other respects to their heterosexual and cisgendered compatriots. These are all very fragile rights, and if you think for a minute that Mike Pence, that the people who've been uh, appointed to serve in Trump's cabinet are going to keep these protections in place, consider the following facts. Tom Price, the new director of Health and Human Services, he's been a leader in the drive to repeal the Affordable Care Act. It is in the Affordable Care Act, Section 1557, that le lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people have a right to equality in health care services. If the ACA goes, that civil rights protection goes as well. He voted against the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. He voted numerous times in favor of a constitutional amendment to make same-sex marriage uh, unconstitutional across the nation. He voted against the inclusion of transgender people under the Hate Crimes Act. And he has been a leader in the attempt to defund Planned Parenthood. All of these cutbacks affect disproportionately, especially the transgender community. The transgender community in this country, especially got, transgender people point. of color, have yeah. some of the worst health care outcomes, the least access to health care, and the highest rates of HIV in the country. In the past two or three years, that has been being rolled back because of the Affordable Care Act. If the Affordable Care Act goes, the access to health care, the gains that have been made by LGBT people, and especially the trans community, will be gone as well. So I'm asking you two things. One, keep track of what is going down. Keep watching as these changes get made and resist in every way you know how. Secondly, we can, in Hawaii, we can no longer depend on the federal government to set the pace, to pr uh, protect our rights, to institute these kinds of policies. There is no equivalent to Title IX under Hawaii law. Let me say that one more time. There is no state law equivalent to Title IX in Hawaii. As Title IX regulations get rolled back, as they no longer are interpreted to protect lesbian, gay, and transgender people, all of our rights in Hawaii will disappear in that regard, unless and until we pass a similar state law that will continue to provide those protections. So contact your legislators. The legislature is in session. We can do this now. Okay? So, act up, fight back, fight hate. Act up, fight back, fight hate.
for the UH System Office of Institutional Equity and our members of Affirm Hawaii. The OIE is a system-wide office tasked with implementing and addressing gender violence and sex-based discrimination on campus. But just yesterday, Trump proposed eliminating the Department of Justice's Violence Against Women grant program, which distributes the funds to organizations committed to ending sexual assault, domestic abuse, and dating violence. He also announced cuts to the Departments of Commerce, Energy, and Transportation. But um, he's completely nixing the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Kuri is a co-founder of Planned Parenthood Hawaii's Young Volunteer Affiliate Group, Affirm Hawaii, and is an advocate for reproductive justice, gender equity, and the intersectional grassroots social movements. And Mikey Oza is a third-year law student at the William S. Richardson School of Law, and she currently works as the program assistant to the director of the OIE. And she's a core member of Affirm Hawaii, a transnational feminist organization. Please welcome Kuri. Hello, everyone. Today I'm really tired, so thank you for bearing with me. Historically, as women, our bodies are sexualized, criticized, brutalized, and regulated without our consent. Our minds and intellects are overlooked, discredited, stolen from, and co-opted. Our labor is taken for granted and undervalued. We can have a, a really extensive discussion on the long list of grievances that this administration has committed against women even before they occupied their new positions of power. But these people don't need more airtime on their criminal agenda. Reading the news every morning is like watching the hate crime Olympics. I wake up and I think, I didn't even know I could be oppressed that way. So instead, I offer solutions to consider as we move forward. This election cycle, this presidency, this administration, and today's occupation is just a reminder that those in positions of power and privilege intend to continue the oppressive justice, injustice that women have faced for generations. And while we all have a right to mourn and to rage, please be aware and take note of this. Reproductive hero Dr. Willie Parker once said, it's at times like these we must remember, it's always been times like these. In your anger and your activism, be conscious that so many of us have endured violations and injustices to our basic human rights for longer than just this movement today. Which brings me to my second point. We must collectively recognize women's rights as human rights. This concept is encapsulated in the fight for reproductive justice. A woman's right to autonomy over her own body and her own health shouldn't just be a choice. It is her human right. It should not be tied to where she lives, how much money she has, or the status of her citizenship. For some women, these are not choices they can make. It is not just about a woman's right to choose, but her ability to make that choice based on her circumstances. This is why we must recognize the importance of intersectionality in this movement for justice. Our advocacy must be intersectional, addressing issues of access to basic human rights, while considering economic status, age, race, gender identity, sexuality, etc. And we need diversity among the people and within the groups who work together to ensure that ultimately women and all people have control over their own health, bodies, and lives. It is a human right to have this freedom. Like you, my identity as a woman, as a person, is multifaceted. Being a woman is just one part that is inextricably tied to other parts of my identity, and this shapes my life experience. I'm not just a woman, but I'm also an immigrant, a survivor of sexual assault. A first generation college graduate who is supported by a family of blue collar under the table cash 
Our anger is justified. It has carried our foremothers through the centuries, and it flows from the love we have for our communities and for ourselves. You don't tell a victim of DV to overcome the abuse by simply loving her batterer. Stop telling marginalized people that love will trump hate. Decolonization will trump hate. Tackling anti-blackness and misogyny within our own communities will trump hate. Exposing and dismantling systems of oppression will trump hate. Only true accountability can and will trump hate. Struggle is our action today. Struggle is our way. It is how we have survived, how our ancestors have survived. No matter how blue this city is, no matter how blue this state is, what we are seeing is the rise of global fascism. And the lives of immigrants, the lives of women, the lives of Kanako Oivi, the lives of LGBTQ friends and family members, the lives of our mothers are at risk. Join us in holding on to one another. Hold tight. Trust women. Struggle with us. And one last word to my sisters. Take heart. Take heart and use your fire. One day, our existence will no longer be under threat. Join us in working toward that day. Get organized. Reach out to a firm Hawaii. We will thrive with dignity. Thank you. in the next four years, and we shall overcome them. Therefore, we're going to sing, We Shall Overcome. Like the other song that we, sang, we sang a few minutes ago, um, We Shall Not Be Moved, this song also has roots in African-American churches. And it was also popularized and became identified with social movements during the labor movement um, by the tobacco workers, um, tobacco farmer workers in South, in South Carolina in 1945. And then, as you probably know, it became an anthem of the civil rights movement popularized by people like Pete Seeger and Joan Baez. It has been sung in different contexts, many different contexts, ranging from anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, Tiananmen Square democracy movement, and currently the demilitarization movement in Okinawa. But here we are, we shall overcome, led by Rachel Strauss. And you shall sing with us. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday.
H. Manoa, the Departments of American Studies, Anthropology, Art and Art History, English, Ethnic Studies, History, Philosophy, Political Science, Sociology, Theater and Dance, and Women's Studies all endorse the Day of Resistance. Student Sociological Association, the Manoa Faculty Senate, and the Arts and Sciences Faculty Senate. Thank you all so much for your support. As we've all probably heard, Donald Trump announced his presidential campaign by giving a speech on the supposed dangers associated with undocumented immigration from Mexico. To cheering crowds, he stated, they're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime, they're rapists. Trump's remarks run contrary to the sociological and criminological research, which indicates that recent immigrants have far lower crime rates than native-born citizens. Despite such facts, Trump has continued to chant that he is going to build a wall, the greatest wall ever, along the US-Mexico border in order to prevent undocumented immigration. The overwhelming evidence indicates that Trump's wall will not only be ineffective in controlling immigration, but will also be extremely costly to the U.S. taxpayer. Here to talk with us about immigration in the era of Trump is Professor, Professor of Sociology Nandita Sharma. social movement anthem, I want to teach us a new anthem for the Trump era. Ready? We don't want your tiny hands anywhere near our underpants. We don't want your tiny hands anywhere near our underpants. We don't want your tiny hands anywhere near our underpants. Don't say Trump didn't give us anything. denounced bankers and immigrants, but only one of these groups was invited to have a seat at his cabinet, and it wasn't immigrants. With the swamp monster safely ensconced in the White House, Trump continues to bash immigrants. We all know that Trump announced day one his candidacy for president by stating that Mexicans were criminals and rapists. Trump regularly denounced immigrants during the rest of his campaign. Remember the demand that a judge with parents who were immigrants recuse himself from the Trump University fraud case? He hasn't let up since he was elected. A top priority for him is to put up a, quote, impenetrable physical wall, unquote, funded by federal dollars, which he continues to insist will be paid for by the Mexican government even as Mexico says no. Trump has a problem understanding that no means no in more ways than one. Trump has also promised a much more severely restricted refugee resettlement program. At one point, Trump advocated a complete and total ban on Muslim refugees. He has not taken that off the table. Given that the largest refugee producing states in the world are where most of the people are Muslims, and not by any accident, places that the US has attacked, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, let us be very clear that what Trump is proposing is to wholly disavow any responsibility for the damage done by US military intervention abroad. Obama only wanted to admit about 100,000 of the millions upon millions of people displaced by U.S. foreign policy, Trump will make that worse. And he will do that through what he calls extreme vetting of future refugees. Trump's nominee for Attorney General, Jeff Sessions, has nodded his assent going as far as to say in his nomination hearings that he thinks that it is perfectly okay to ask 
people what their religion is before allowing them to enter the United States. We need to be very clear what this means. Were Trump to start vetting people by their religion, he would be re-institutionalizing racism in immigration law. You know, the kind of law that barred Jewish people fleeing Nazi Germany from entering the United States. Are we going to allow that to happen? Yeah. Trump has also promised to unleash what he calls a deportation force targeting millions of undocumented migrants. He wants to immediately deport two to three million people, quote, that are criminal and have criminal records, unquote, out of the country. Experts say that Trump's plan would require going well beyond deporting undocumented people because there are simply not enough unauthorized immigrants with criminal records to meet Trump's quota. Trump's deportation force would have to target green card holders and other lawfully present non-citizens who have criminal records. And because discretion over what type of crime warrants deportation rests with the president, people could be deported for very minor and non-violent offenses. We would be in a situation where a president who has bragged about sexually assaulting women would be deporting people charged with littering. Are we going to let that happen? No. The people that Trump wants to deport doesn't stop there. He wants to revoke the work authorizations and cancel the university opportunities for the 750,000 people known as the Dreamers, who were provided by these protections when Obama created the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, by executive action. Are we going to let that happen? No! We are not going to allow that to happen because standing by while Trump intensifies Obama's already all-time record of deportation is precisely how fascism will enter the United States. Let, let us not forget that every fascist regime that has existed and every wannabe fascist today has used the figure of the immigrant, the foreigner, the outsider to mobilize support. Marine Le Pen in France, N Nigel Farage in Britain, both of whom attended Trump's inauguration today, ran on an explicitly anti-immigrant agenda. Once the kind of police state that is required to institutionalize Trump's deportation force is put into place, we would be foolish to think that it's going to stop there. Fascism happens when one group is targeted and the rest of us gleefully look on or cower behind our doors as our neighbors, those labeled as threats to national society by the state, are rounded up. Then, as the promised jobs don't materialize or they turn out to be bad jobs, another group is rounded up. And then another group, and then another group is rounded up until we hear our own door being broken down. Are we going to let that happen? No. Reinstitutionalizing racism, denouncing immigrants, refusing to accept refugees from American wars and beyond, ramping up deportation, none of this will do a single thing to make U.S. citizens get a job or feel more secure. What his anti-immigration policies will do is push more people to live and work in the United States without documents and push more people into a brutal, super exploited underground economy that takes advantage of people's undocumented status. And that, folks, is the real Trump agenda on immigration. He will pass draconian immigration laws to lower the working and living conditions of the working class. Immigrants will face the brunt of this, but citizens are not immune. Far from it. Contrary 
to all of the immigrant, anti-immigrant rhetoric of the rich and powerful, the goal of anti-immigration policies is not to get rid of immigrants, but to make immigrants more vulnerable, more vulnerable to the demands of employers, to the demands of landlords, to the demands of anyone who threatens to report them to the government's deportation force. Fomenting fear is the real anti-immigrant agenda. Fear makes people's labor cheaper. Fear makes people less likely to organize. Fear is the boss's best friend. And since the very first immigration policy in the United States, this fear has been delivered in a shiny box with a big bow to the boss's door by the state. Have we not noticed that the only time that the wealthy and powerful talk about how much they love and respect the working class is when they're bashing immigrants? On any other day, they're busy destroying workers' lives. Case in point, Trump's nominee for labor secretary, the fast food mogul Stephen Puzder, who not only opposes workers' demands for a $15 an hour minimum wage, but actually opposes the existence of any minimum wage at all. The Trump agenda is to try and ensure that citizens and immigrants never come together in unity to fight the capitalist agenda. This strategy of divide and conquer along national lines has worked very well, president after president. It worked for Obama, who after incorporating the immigrant rights slogan of Si Se Puede, Yes We Can, into his own campaign rhetoric, deported over 2.5 million people, including 10,000 unaccompanied minors fleeing violence in Central America, the largest deportation in U.S. history. It worked for Bush, who set up a special registry targeting young Muslim men living in the United States. It worked for Clinton, who greatly expanded the grounds for detaining and deporting immigrants and funneled more and more undocumented migrants to the most deadly border crossings. It worked for Reagan, who made it illegal to hire or recruit undocumented immigrants, something that was said to be tough on employers, but became another tool in their arsenal against workers. unity, a unity of workers against racism, sexism, homophobia, and a global workers' movement against nationalism. If we do this, we are unstoppable. Another world is possible. We are unstoppable. Another by Nandita, threat has, Trump has threatened to overturn DACA, which is more commonly referred to as the DREAM Act. In response, hundreds of colleges and universities across the campus, across the country, have responded, publicly supporting the continuation of the DACA program by the federal government. We are proud to say that at the University of Hawaii, President David Lassner has stated, our undocumented students are an integral part of our community, and we will continue to extend all the rights, privileges, and services available to our students from application through graduation, regardless of citizenship status. Thank you, David Lassner. Lassner for reconfirming your commitment to serving all members of our community. Our next speaker is an undergraduate student in the liberal arts and a member of the Aloha Dream Team, Nisa Salakala Kala. Aloha. 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 
to do that. Thank you. <laughs> cool, my dream. So my name is Nisa. Um, I'm currently a college student, and I'm here uh, to give you guys an insight of uh, better. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, what it is to be a young, undocumented immigrant. And um, we're going to talk about DACA, uh, Trump's agenda, and what it means, uh, uh, the point of view from an undocumented immigrant before and after Trump's agenda. Okay, so what is deferred, uh, what is DACA? It's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, it is a kind of administrative relief from deportation. So. What that is, is it gives uh, young undocumented immigrants uh, protection from deportation. Uh, they get a work permit and you get um, other amenities such as uh, getting a driver's license and other things such as that. So here in Hawaii, uh, we're really blessed to have the UH policy to allow undocumented immigrants into uh, schools and into uh, universities where we are now. So. It's uh, really reassuring to an undocumented immigrant um, getting that email from uh, President Lassner reassuring that safety because um, under Trump's agenda, he wants to res rescind DACA. So what that means to us is um, a sense of safety being gone. Um, before before DACA, we had there was a there was a sense of fear of you going to school, going to the grocery store. Uh, wherever you are, in your home, getting taken out of your home and being de deported. Young undocumented immigrants usually come here when they're very young, and it's not their fault. It's usually they come on a visa and they overstay, and they, they don't know. And they grow up in America, and they're just Americans. So if DACA is taken away, the fear comes back, and that would be really bad. So today I just wanted to talk about that, and what you can do to help. So I'm a part of a, a community organization called Aloha Dream Team. And what we do is we do outreach and awareness and we go out into the community, we go to schools and we go to, uh, we go to churches and all that and we, we talk to undocumented communities and, and try and find them and help them and help them get DACA and, and just have that safe space and that safety. Uh, so what can you do to help? Uh, First thing we need to do is stay together and work together. So, like Professor Nan Dina said, um, we can't be divided. We have to stay together and we have to work towards a cause and helping undocumented immigrants. Uh, we urge you to call your senators and representatives and stand up and fight for what is right. So, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. It is time to sing again. This is a somewhat, a little bit different kind of song than the other two that we sung. Um, it has origins, actually, it was originally written by an Englishman who was involved in the transatlantic slave trade. So he was on the ship crossing the Atlantic and he got into this violent storm that nearly killed him and the rest of his ship. That's when he had this moral and spiritual awakening and, when, and this is when he composed the song which then became a very commonly sung hymn in American churches, and it also became very commonly sung in various kinds of social movement settings. As many of you will recall, when a white supremacist went to a church, African-American church, in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015, shot and killed nine people in the Bible study group, President Obama went to the funeral, and at the end of this very solemn and moving speech, eulogy, he spontaneously sang Amazing Grace. So this is what we're going to sing. We do not have to be Christian or religious to appreciate and reflect upon the meaning of this concept, grace, what President Obama, Obama described as the reservoir of goodness in us. We'll just dive right into this one, as most of you will know it.
reasonable searches and seizures requiring that the government get a warrant with probable cause describing the place to be searched and the persons and things to be seized. And that right has a special place in the Hawaii Constitution, which explicitly mentions the right to privacy. And then it says that the legislature, legislature must take affirmative steps to implement this right. Keep him, keep him in the picture. So, what's going on with the right of privacy and mass surveillance? Numerous government agencies, including the National Security Agency, NSA, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and also state and local police enforcement, intrude upon the private communications of innocent citizens, amass vast databases of who we call and when, and catalog suspicious activities based on the vaguest standards. 
the government's indiscriminate collection of information is itself an invasion of the right to privacy. Yeah. But its use of this data is also rife with abuse. That data is fed into watch lists with severe consequences. Innocent individuals have found themselves unable to board planes, barred from certain types of jobs, shut out of their bank accounts, and repeatedly questioned by the authorities. Now, I'm going to focus on surveillance by the NSA, which is the most egregious, and it was the one that was reported and in the news about three years ago, four years ago, when, when Edward Snowden revealed what was going on. Yeah, why not? Yeah. It's just a hop, skip, and a But again, there are other forms of surveillance, and I'll touch upon them a little bit later. So, NSA has gone far beyond its counterterrorism and foreign intelligence mandate, implementing a massive system to conduct bulk surveillance of millions of innocent Americans. Thanks to Snowden, we know that the NSA was regularly tracking the calls of hundreds of millions of Americans and spying on a vast but unknown number of Americans' international calls, text messages, and emails. Although the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, what is called the FISA Court, oversees the government surveillance activities, it operates in nearly total secrecy through one-sided procedures that heavily favor the government. Its opinions and decisions and the arguments are all secret. These programs were justified by two pieces of legislation. The first one is the Patriot Act. And the second one is called the FISA Amendment Act. And I'll be brief on each one of those and the programs they, they justify. Under Section 212 of the Patriot Act, the government claimed sweeping authority to collect a record, essentially the metadata, of every single phone call made by every single American on an ongoing daily basis. Battery power, I guess. In 2013, the ACLU filed a lawsuit challenging that program. Uh, and a U.S. appellate court later in 2015 found that the program was violated the law. The other so Congress had to amend, amend the Patriot Act, and now the system is a little bit different. And essentially, the telecom companies are, you know, Verizon, AT&T, they're supposed to keep records of all your calls, all that metadata themselves, waiting for a warrant from the government, from this secret court, from the FISA court. And then when the government goes to the FISA court, they get a warrant, they can then get information from a specific targets, but not only the information of those specific targets, but also of their friends, up to two degrees of separation. And then every 180 days, they can get another warrant and another warrant to keep spying on a specific people. Now, I'm gonna talk about the second act of Congress, the FISA Amendment Act of 2008. That act gives the NSA almost unchecked power to monitor Americans' international phone calls, text messages, and emails under the guise of targeting foreigners abroad. Now, the Snowden revelation showed that under this program, an unknown number of purely domestic communications are being monitored, that the rules that are supposed to protect Americans' privacy are weak and riddled with exceptions, and that virtually every email that goes into or out of the United States is scanned for suspicious keywords. The ACLU has tried to challenge this program also with mixed results. And the fact of the matter is that because the government doesn't quite admit what it's doing and because we don't know who is being targeted, it's very hard to challenge in court. It's also very hard to convince the courts that national security that national security should be put aside and the privacy rights should be pri primary. Now, 
the ACLU has been advocating for bringing transparency to the FISA court. Recent news reports revealed that the FISA court in 2015 ordered Yahoo to scan all of its customers' incoming emails and turn over those containing a certain digital signature to the government. This is an unprecedented expansion of the law that reportedly authorized the surveillance. But without access to the opinion, to the legal opinion, we don't know what the court's legal reasoning is or how broadly it sweeps. Secret laws have no place in democracy. And we as citizens have the right to know, at least in general terms, what kinds of information the government is collecting. Now, let me close with a few words about what you can do to fight these programs, which Trump is going to inherit and he's going to use against immigrants, against people of color, against the LGBTQ community. First, know your rights. Information is power and it prevents abuse. I brought with me Know Your Rights wallet cards. Please take them. They tell you what to do if you're stopped by the police. And for those marching later, just a, a, a few things about your rights. One is you have the right to remain silent. That's meaningful. If the police comes and asks you questions, you can say, I don't want to answer those questions. You, you can ask, am I under arrest? And if they tell you, no, you, you're not under arrest, you can say, am I free to go? And if they say yes, go. And very importantly, if they ask you, so who are your friends? Who else is marching with you? Do not give out names. You have the right to remain silent. So let me just close by saying that this is a marathon, this is not a sprint, and change in the courts often follow change in society. So act up. Thank you. In these trying times, it's necessary that we make the connections between the global, yeah, national, and local right struggles. At the university level, the Graduate Student Organization has been tirelessly working to unionize graduate students for the past three years. This is an ongoing project that will resume upon this legislative session. Today, Ben Rodden, the advocacy chair of GSO and member of Labor Fest Hawaii, is here to talk about what we can do at the local level to resist the Trump administration. Everybody. It's a lot of people, a lot of colorful signs, it looks a lot like a resistance. Uh, normally I've been asked to... Louder! Speak closer to the mic! Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the last time I was here I was asked to speak about the politics of labor, and today I want to talk a little more about the labor of politics itself. Uh, which is a fancy way of saying there's a lot of work that needs to be done. So I want to start just by thanking the. Uh, sorry, I want to start by thanking the organizers and supporters of this event who have made all these signs and put this together. There was a lot of work that goes into it. In my experience trying to organize graduate assistants, I often run into the same problem over and over again. They don't have the time to do everything that we need to be doing. Their, demand, their time is being demanded by a rigorous academic schedule, by the jobs that they do and don't get paid enough to do, and the extra jobs they have to do outside of that. It's deeply troubling to me to see how much people have to work just to get by here. And the way in which work, constant work prevents people from being able to enter into the political sphere. It's a way of limiting politics to the wealthy and well-connected by forcing everyone else to constantly have to work in order to just get by. So I want to talk a little bit about what we can do at the local level to help resist Trump. Trumpism, this thing we're calling Trumpism, is not going to come to Hawaii in the form of a tsunami. 
There's not going to be any sort of warning signs. You're not going to see it coming. It's going to seep in gradually and slowly. So one of the first things we can do is to take note of the weird changes that, are, that have been happening since his election. I don't know if anyone else noticed, but after the election, the state of Hawaii decided to stop negotiating with all the unions. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. So, uh, I want to go briefly over some of the things that GSO is doing this legislative session. We just approved our agenda last night unanimously, and how it relates to what Trump is trying to do. Trump has appointed a fast food billionaire to be his Secretary of Labor. As Nandita pointed out, he doesn't believe in the minimum wage, and he doesn't believe in sick days. So the GSO has joined in a coalition of other unions, advocacy groups, and activists to fight for a $15 an hour minimum wage and paid sick days for all workers. He has nominated a Secretary of Education that doesn't believe in public education and has links to conversion therapy in Michigan. So the GSO has locked arms with our K through 12 teachers to pass a constitutional amendment that would provide taxes on vacation rentals and investment property to fully fund our schools. And we will lock arms with our LGBTQ members to pass a law banning conversion therapy in the state of Hawaii. Finally, Donald Trump has nominated for the Treasury Secretary a billionaire banker whose past job was stealing homes from poor people he gave predatory loans to. He wants to, he wants to decimate the social service net so that he can offer lucrative tax breaks to the already wealthy and already well-connected. So we will join forces with advocacy groups who are pushing to bring back Hawaii's top income for tax bracket so that we can then generate enough revenue to give tax breaks to poor people for things like rent, food, and economic security. These are just some of the many things that we can do locally. And to conclude, I just want to say, that a resistance movement is a lot of work. It takes all of us. Everybody has a job to do. So take some time and stumble into what that is for you and how you can do it brilliantly. Thank you.
lot of time went into today, and we really appreciate your time and your efforts. I feel hopeful when I look at you guys. Yo, Whoever thought I'd be wearing an apron, yeah? This is something that of uh, talking too quietly, so I'm not going to start now. <laughs> Look, I'm here, I'm here today because I'm tremendously encouraged by what's going on. I want to thank Donald Trump, because without him, we wouldn't be sitting here today, and we wouldn't be talking about getting together to resist anything. If we, without Donald Trump attacking everybody in this country, there would be, there, he's given us reason to unite. Now, for, for centuries and thousands of years, human beings have been trying to deal with the problem of how do you have a society that cares about the people when it is in fact run by the people that make money off the other people. Our society is a society where the billionaires make money off of you and me and everybody else that works for a living, and there's two kinds of people in this society. It's the guys of people that work and produce and, and make things for all the rest of us, who teach our kids or clean the hotel rooms, all those things unite us because we're the ones who do the work. But, yeah, we are the ones who do the work. And we have the smallest, greediest, richest, most narrow-minded, backward bunch of billionaires that have taken over our country and they have dis dispersed and dis they've, they've given up the illusion that there's going to be caring about people, that people are going to be treated equally. They've given that up. They've taken their dictatorship and brought it out of this legislative tape where they exercise power through politicians arguing, and they're putting billionaires right smack in charge, and everything you heard today is, is going to happen because of that. We are, we are not fighting Donald Trump here. We are fighting the billionaires that control Donald Trump. We're is the highest achievement of working people in thousands of years. We have rights to assemble. We can complain about them taking it away. We, we built those things. Working people fought for those things. We fought the revolution. We fought the civil war. We fought, we fought all through our history of protests. It is working people and our action that has made progress happen in this country. Because that should be obvious to everyone. What we need to worry about is how we're going to win. I stood here 40 years ago and I was in college and I set my mind to set out and become somebody who would help the people get organized and strong so we can have a strong people's democracy, a community that cares about us and not a government that just tries to exploit us and help those people who've got their hands in our pocket and their, and their knife to our throats. I was here a few years ago when they tried to raise the tuition in this institution, which is a direct attack on my members and everybody else who, who, whose future and whose family and whose hopes and dreams come about with their hopes for their children, our grandchildren, that's you. You are the ones that we go work for. You are the ones we're fighting for. And this institution and all the public institutions that educate our people are what we need to have the kind of future that we're fighting for and, and, and working for. Okay, so. But it isn't just going to happen. The reason they won, the reason the billionaires won this election is because we are not organized to defeat them. They won in Michigan because the billionaires took all of those union jobs and sent it overseas and left a whole bunch of angry, angry workers who had lost everything. They lost their jobs. They lost their communities. They came back and took their houses. They're angry. They want to change. That's a good thing. Let's show the way for working people to have a change that's good, not have a change to put the billionaires in charge. Local 5 is not helpless. We know what they're going to do, and it's not going to happen gradually. He's signing executive orders as we speak that he's taking back every good thing that Obama ever did. Today, he's going to be, it's clear in the Republican 
platform. It's clear to see what they've already passed. They're going to cap Medicare. They're going to attack our seniors. They're going to go after our single families, our mostly working mothers, by taking away tax breaks. They're going to do those things. They've already said so. They got the votes to do it, and they got a president that's going to sign it. So those things are going to happen. Those attacks are underway now. The question isn't whether we're going to get attacked. The question is, what are we going to do about it? structure. We have workers who have taken responsibility to lead others. We have built, we've shown the ability to turn thousands of workers out to fight on the streets for what's necessary. And that has made us possible to build a high standard for tourism workers in this state, one of the highest in the world, the third highest in the world. We're proud of that. We know how to do it. And you can do it too. The secret is to get organized. The secret is to build organization so that we have the ability, the tools to turn us out in force. We're not going to win this if we don't get organized. It is working people and our organizations that have to step up to the plate now. And I'm talking about student organizations too. If you guys were billionaires' kids, you'd be going to Harvard, not UH. This is an institution for working people. That's why we fought for it. That's why we fight for it today. That's why we're going to fight for it in the future. We need a movement that can't be denied. We cannot let them devalue us, whether it be women or immigrants or people of color or whatever. We are the people that make society run. We have a right and a duty to maintain our democracy. And if we don't do it, nobody's going to do it. So we're here. No, the, the right wing guys wrap themselves in the flag and pretend that they're patriotic when they're trying to take away everything that is good about our Constitution, attack everything that is good in our society. They want to take away what America fought for, what America should be. They want to take it away and go the other side. It is on us to defend our country, it's on us to protect our society. It's our job. We're not going to lie down and let them just take everything that we fought for. Our members are going to stand up and fight. We have contract negotiations next year for every single hotel on that beach. We have contract negotiations where we can come out and say, no, we're not going to let you billionaires take away what we've hot fought for and what we want. We're going to not only defeat that, but we're going to move it forward. We're going to go take away your power and give it back to the people. So our future is in our hands. If all we do today is complain about what they're, what they are doing to us, we're going to lose. We are going to lose if all we do is complain, if all we do is tweet, if all we do is email. The only way that they're going to pay attention to us is when we get on the street and kick some butt. We also have a golden opportunity to, uh, next year. Because next year in the world, everybody in this country who wants a better future, everybody who wants to turn back what this nasty stuff that's happened in this past that's election. Organizing. Everybody's going to be looking at the 2018 elections. Right. We are looking for right candidates now. now. Yeah. We are finding people now. We're going to stand up and run on a program for people's power and push this thing back. Let's take our community back. This is, this is not anti-American. This is what it means to be American. Yeah. Yeah. This is what it means. I'm glad to see the organizations being formed here today. We need to build up more of them, get more people involved. We need to be able to move people together, whether it be on the street or to the voting booth. We need to be able to have organization so that we don't counteract each other. If I vote for somebody and you vote for the opposition, we just cancel out our vote. It's on us to figure out who's on our side and who's, uh, who's going to help us fight those guys who got their hands in our pocket and help win this next election. I'm not talking about 
electoral democracy, guys. Elections are important because if we can't win them, we don't matter. But that's not what it's all about. We will win elections if we are organized, if we are able to act as one, if we're able to work out for ourselves what we all agree on and time effective things. Frederick Douglass said it best. If you, if you want progress, there has to be struggle. If you want crops, you have to plow the land. Frederick Douglass said this 150 years ago, and he was right. If we want progress, if we want a better society, we better fight, guys. And today is the start. You guys are going to march from here. Let's do the march, guys, and show what it takes. construction manager. I knew the in ways out and everything and used to come up here. So that's over 60 years ago. And to be here now from when I was a little boy with my girlfriend hiding out there listening to the orchestra play, uh, it's kind of significant. Story behind this song, all Hawaii stands, stand together, okay? We need to stand together. I want to pay tribute to someone who came to me in a dream a few years ago as we have been in the midst of a lot of transition. His name is Don Ho. And it was Don Ho that asked me to write a song because I was gonna go back to, back out on the Aina, you know? And so about four, four hours later, I went to his dressing room and all of us stand together. I handed it to him. He was the first person to record it with the Kauai Hau Choir. And then it was translated by our revered Kupuna Pilahipaki into the Olelo Kanaka. Anyway, he loved his Hawaiian people. And in the dream, he was concerned because it was smoky, it was gray, it wasn't the Hawaii that Don Ho knew. And he came up to me and he asked me, and you wouldn't be able to recognize Don Ho on the street. You'd think he was a homeless guy. Truly, baggy, dark glasses, little kofa hat. And he came up to me and he said, Liko, what are you gonna do? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna aloha the whole world, like Don did, okay? You invite people to a party and you throw open the door. You don't say there's no food. You just keep adding tables, okay? So we're gonna sing All Hawaii Stand Together and we're gonna start off with in Kanaka Olelo, and then we're going to come on the screen and 
the English version, so this, it's going to come on, and by then maybe you'll kind of get the, the beat of it, and please sing along, okay? So, the Hawaiian verse is talking about traveling, and I, Don used to call me the wanderer, you know? And, and truly, I still wander, and it's really great <laughs> to wander. Um, so, it talks about traveling, traveling through the land, seeing when you know you want to raise your voice and you want to you want to bring you know bring the story out then it talks about the sacred places in hawaii and mauna kea uh, the, the, and, and regaining these things putting things that we have lost touch with putting us back there putting them with us to our aina and including everyone okay that's very important Especially with the political things that are going on now, okay? Unity, okay? So anyway, Hawaii loa kuli ke kako was the translation of all Hawaii stand together. So please, just let us take you on a little Hawaiian language journey, okay? Okay, ready? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
nation to guide the destiny of our generation to sing and praise the glory of our land. From within stone walls and cities of refuge, we learn the sacred way.